Hi friends, so we are going to begin lecture three in our wind turbine aerodynamics course. And today we are going to look at momentum theory and I'm going to derive the equation of power. And then I'm going to solve a simple problem about how much power can be generated by a given wind turbine. So this is one of the main design considerations whenever you are designing a wind turbine is how much power you are going to generate from it. So that's the reason why wind turbines are developed. So if we look at the typical flow field in the wind turbine, from our previous lecture, we have seen that the velocity of air far in front of the rotor disc is U infinity. At the rotor disc, this velocity reduces to u infinity 1 minus a. And then far downstream in the wake, it reduces to 1 minus 2a into u infinity, where u infinity, of course, is the free stream speed. And we use ud as the speed at the rotor disc. So d stands for disc. And uw is the speed far downstream. So w here stands for the wake. And of course, this is the stream tube within which the flow is taking place. And we presume that there is no mixing of air inside the stream tube and outside the stream tube. So now to write this conclusion, which we derived in our previous lecture, when we got the velocities for the flow field, half the actual speed loss in the stream tube takes place upstream, that is ahead of the rotor disc and the remaining half takes place downstream. So here it becomes one minus a into u infinity, and here it becomes one minus two a into u infinity. So that's the basic idea you get about the velocities. Now, of course, we saw that we needed equations for pressure. And so the equations came from momentum equation and from Bernoulli equation. And these equations relate pressure velocity and density. So the equation for momentum is given here. That is PD plus minus PD minus into AD equals U infinity minus UW into rho AD U infinity one minus A. And then from Bernoulli, we got the pressure differential, which is PD plus minus PD minus, that is half rho U infinity square minus UW square. Now, why we are so interested in pressure changes across the actuator disk is that this is going to lead us to the force. And once we get force, we can obtain power from there also. So essentially force is related to work and work is related to power. So let's look at the force at the actuator disk. Like we mentioned in the slide before, the force is PD plus minus PD minus into AD. And so this is this equation given here. This is the momentum equation. Now, immediately we can do some substitutions. We can substitute UW by one minus two A into U infinity from the flow field. So once we substitute that, I can write this equation out here. So what I have done is I have replaced UW by one minus two A U infinity. Then we expand this equation out here. We get this equation and then we cancel out the U infinity and the negative u infinity, and so we get this term here. Only 2a u infinity remains from the expression inside the brackets. And then I can write down that f is this equation here. Now, this uh, second part is what we derived here today. So essentially, this is 2 rho ad u infinity square a1 minus a. And of course, the basic definition of force comes from the fact that it's the pressure differential into the area at the rotor disk. So remember, AD is nothing but pi r square, where r is the radius of the wind turbine. Now, once we have obtained the expression for force, we can obtain the expression for power because always remember that power is the rate of work done by the force. So essentially, power is force into the velocity of air at the rotor disk. So what happens is that I take the expression for force and I have multiplied it by UD. 
Now remember u d is u infinity 1 minus a, so I get this equation here. So all that has happened is that u infinity has now got cubed and 1 minus a has got squared because I have replaced u d by u infinity 1 minus a. So this is the expression for power and this is going to tell us a lot of things about wind turbine design. So this equation is so important that we should look at it for a long time and you know if you are in the habit of looking at equations after some time the equations start talking to you. So essentially this equation tells you several things. You can clearly see that power is directly proportional to u infinity cube which means that high wind speeds would greatly help here. So as wind speed goes up, this is going to go up dramatically because remember u infinity is always a positive number. So this is going to become very high. Now, if we look at the rotor radius, the rotor radius also going to help because AD is going to be equal to pi r square. So essentially it's going to be a function of r square. That is power is going to be directly proportional to r square and density is also going to help here. Now, you can see some of the elements of wind turbine design here. You always want to locate the wind turbines in regions of high wind speed. That's the most important thing. Secondarily, you want to make the wind turbine rotor as big as possible, which would increase the AD because pi r square would go up. So these are some of the things which you see in wind turbines. You see wind turbines are typically located in places which have high wind speed and increasingly the rotors are larger and larger. So the constraint here is mostly structural and design and failure and cost in terms of how big the wind turbine rotors can be. So you will see that some of the rotors which are coming up are extremely large. These are megawatt, gen megawatt generating turbines. So now let us look at the power coefficient. So the power coefficient is obtained by non-dimensionalizing the power value. So the equation for power we saw in the previous slide that was 2 rho AD u infinity cube A 1 minus A square. And so to non-dimensionalize this, I divide by half rho u infinity cube AD. And so this gives me a nice and compact equation Cp equals 4A into 1 minus a square. So this is very compact because it's completely dependent on this factor a. Now, of course, as an engineer, immediately you will pass the question that what should be the value of a here? And of course, we would like the value of Cp to be maximized. That is the highest possible power coefficient is best for us. So let's look at how that could be done. So now we look at calculus because we know that if we have a function and we want to find the maximum or minimum point, we should differentiate it and set it equal to zero. And then we should look at its second derivative to figure out whether that point is a minimum or maximum point. So we do that here. We take the derivative of Cp and put it equal to zero. So essentially I expand Cp out here. Cp was 4a into 1 minus a square. So if I expand that 1 minus a square, I get 1 minus 2a plus a square. And then I get this term 4a minus 8a square plus 4a cube. Now I take the derivative here. So I get dcp by dA and I get this equation. So derivative is 4 minus 16a plus 12a square. And then I can take the 4 out. And so I get this equation here. And so what should happen is that 1 minus 4a plus 3a square should be equal to 0. Now, I could factorize it. If you go back to your high school algebra, you will recollect how we can factorize a quadratic like this, or you could solve this as a quadratic equation using the formula. So we have just shown here that 1 minus a into 1 minus 3a, if you expand it out, you are going to get 1 minus 4a plus 3a square. So essentially we have the same thing here and therefore this equation 1 minus a 1 minus 3a equal to 0 and therefore we have two roots for this quadratic equation which are a equals 1 that's coming from 1 minus a equal to 0 and a is equal to 1 by 3 which is coming from 1 minus 3a equal to 0. So these are the two roots. So if you know from calculus then 
these two are the stationary points of the function CP. Now we need to figure out which of these points is a minimum point and which is a maximum point. So what we do is we take the first derivative which is dcp by dA and we differentiate it once again so we get the second derivative and the second derivative is going to be negative 16 plus 24a so I've written that out here and then we put first a equals to 1 and then a equals to 1 third in this equation here and so in the first case I get if I put a equal to 1 that this second derivative is actually a positive number which is the sign of a minimum point and the second case a equal to 1 3 gives the second derivative that's a negative number which shows this is a maximum point now if you have any confusion about this you can see some of the optimization lectures which I have specifically on minimum point and maximum point and so on and let us look at this physically now if you see a equal 1 what would happen is that here the ud would be 0 so that's like a kind of trivial solution that means the air is just coming to a stop here but if we look at a equal to 1 third then we get a much more reasonable solution that is the velocity here is u infinity it comes down here to 1 minus 1 by 3 into u infinity and here it becomes 1 minus 2 by 3 into u infinity so that's the flow field in case I want maximum power. These are the air speeds which are given in red here. Far upstream, the wind velocity is u infinity. At the rotor disk, it becomes two third of u infinity. Downstream in the wake, it becomes one third of u infinity. So what's happening here is that the wind turbine or the actuator disk is extracting power from the wind and therefore naturally the wind is slowing down or the air velocity is slowing down as it is passing through the wind turbine. Now this value which we created this maximum achievable value of the power coefficient it is known as the bed's limit and you cannot typically design a wind turbine which is better than the bed's limit because this is a fact which is coming from the physics and the mathematics of the system. So we can take CP and we can put the value A equal to one third here and we get the value 0.593. So that's essentially the best CP which you can do for the wind turbine. And the reason this limit exists is because you are creating a stream tube and the air is essentially expanding upstream of the actuator disk and so that limits the value of power which you can generate. It's all about the flow field and the equations concerned within the assumptions which have been made for the equations. So we can also now get the trust coefficient. So again, let's go back to our equation for force. This was the equation for force here. And we can create a non-dimensional force which acts on the actuator disk, which is caused by the pressure drop. So that CT is trussed by half rho u infinity square AD. And if we do the algebra here, you're going to get some cancellations. U infinity square cancels out, AD cancels out, rho cancels out, and you get 4A into 1 minus A. So that's the truss generated by the wind turbine. Now, remember in the case of the wind turbine, we are really interested in power. We don't care too much about trust. Where we care about trusts are rotors which generate trust for example helicopters and propeller their aim is to actually generate trust where power is being expended in those situations but in the case of the wind turbine the power is actually being extracted in this situation and trust is a byproduct so at the bets limit the ct is going to be 8 by 9 so what we do here is we plug a equal to one third and so we get this particular value here so let us summarize some of the things we learned in today's lecture. We saw that power varies with wind speed cubed. Power varies with rotor radius squared. For maximum power, the air speed reduces by one third at the rotor disk and another one third at the rotor wake. And essentially the design guideline is that we want to locate large diameter wind turbines at high wind speed regions. That is our basic aim and that is coming from this nice equation. Now you can of course think about certain possibilities here if you were to locate a wind turbine on a different planet maybe which has a much higher density 
you could generate much greater power here so there is also a direct relation here with density of air now this is generally not a problem in most cases if you are locating it on earth but you can imagine various scenarios of planetary wind turbines and so on now let's look at an example to solidify some of the concepts today let's consider a wind turbine with a radius of 3 meter and a wind speed of 6 meter per second and the question is what is the maximum power which you can generate from this wind turbine and you want to find the air velocity at the actuated disk and in the wake and also you want to calculate areas upstream and downstream of the rotor disk so this is a typical problem you are often faced in wind turbine design and here the first thing you have to realize is that the cp max you can take to be 0.593 because this is the maximum power which can be extracted from the air by a wind turbine and then we calculate the area of the rotor disk that's pi r square so that's 3.14159 into 3 square because r is the rotor radius that comes to 28.27 meter square now power is going to be half into cp into rho into ad into the velocity of the wind cube so i plug all these values here the density of air is 1.22 kg per meter cube and also the wind velocity was 6 meter per second so i get 2.208 kilowatt here so this comes out to be the power going to be generated by the wind turbine now at the rotor disk the velocity is going to be 1 minus a into v infinity which is 4 meter per second at the wake it is going to be 1 minus 2 a into v infinity which is 2 meter per second so again as you can expect 6 meter per second far out it is becoming 4 meter per second at the rotor disk is becoming 2 meter per second in the wake and then finally we write down the continuity equation between the far front at the rotor disk and at the wake so essentially the area of cross section into the velocity remains same and from this i can get that a infinity is 18.84 meter square and a w is 56.56 meter square so the air out in front or the cross section out in front is going to be 18.84 meter square it's then going to expand at the disk to 28.27 and then in the wake it's going to expand to 56.56 meter square so you are clearly getting an idea about how the entire stream tube is varying as the air flows into the wind turbine and then goes behind it so these are of course very useful numbers which our simple momentum theory has given us and so we now have a clear mathematical tool through which we can actually calculate the power which can be generated by a wind turbine so for example if you are given a design problem that you need to create 100 megawatts of power then you would need to create a wind farm which would have a plethora of wind turbines which would totally generate that much power and so this essentially gives you a good way to preliminary calculate some of these factors of course you realize that prediction of wind speed is going to be one of the most important problems here because the wind speed itself is not a deterministic variable it is a ra random variable which is going to vary depending on the time of the day the seasons the different locations and so on so wind turbine power may not be something which is completely deterministic at all times so that's something we have to factor in maybe we can couple wind turbines with things such as solar power and also nuclear or conventional sources of energy and then we can supply power during all times of the day and night using this particular mechanism so that was the end of today's lecture three again if you have not subscribed to my channel please do so and certainly like the videos because you know when you like videos youtube likes it also and it recommends those videos to other people who may also benefit from this knowledge of wind turbines if you have any comments or questions you can leave them in the comment section below and i will see you in the next lecture where i am going to talk about the blade element momentum theory because you saw in today's lecture we only discussed the wind turbine geometry as far as the radius is concerned we didn't discuss anything else 
what's the blade cord, what's the air pulse section, and so on. So some of these details are of course necessary. And for that, we have to go to the blade level and then develop the theory there. So I'll end this lecture now and I will see you in a video sometime soon. See you then.